everybody. You are here for an episode of Fear the Walking Biters. This is Diane, your 40-something who is a little sunburnt, very jet-lagged, and has ankles that look like waterlogged zombies. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I'm so, oh, poor me. I just came back from a week in Hawaii. Oh, wah, wah, wah. As always, this is your zombified 30-something Brian. Um... When you were on the plane, did you think about 462? I did. I actually had my knitting needles in my bag for the trip over and the trip back. But, you know, unfortunately, I didn't have to use them. Uh, that is good to hear. <laughs> I actually had several pairs, so I was well equipped. Yeah, so, all right. You uh, you missed my solo adventure of me talking to myself for 25 minutes. I'm glad everybody stuck through and, and actually... Somewhat enjoyed it, I guess. I don't know what the hell got into a bunch of people, but people were supportive of me and my my solo endeavor. So that was pretty cool. I was no, happy I checked the that. Facebook page. There were people who were really down with it. So that's cool. Yeah, blew them, blew me away. <laughs> well, so let's rate it right off. What do you think it was this week? You know, it was uh, three severed life rafts out of five. <laughs> you and I are right on. So mine was three severed hands in the water intake uh. out of five. <laughs> yeah, it was just a little, you know, uh, we're, we're, I think we're, we're all still kind of waiting for that big breakout episode. Yeah. For that one where you go, holy smokes, yes. I mean, there was definitely some cool stuff in this episode, which we'll get into. But I was, by the end of this episode, I was like, please kill somebody in the last five minutes. Please kill somebody. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting for a big emotional event. Yeah. I'm also waiting for a big um, physical event. You know, that stuff's got to come into play here, too, at some point. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, the zombies coming over the, the crest of the beach, that was good. That was a good start, but I think it, it could have gone on from there. It did feel a little rushed. Um, it just, uh, you know, we're we're still waiting for that breakout. Uh, that's really all I can say. But there's still enough stuff here kind of going on. Yeah. Building up to a luxury home in the hills of Baja, California. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I do think that we are going to get that big breakout. I'm just not sure when or how they're going to handle it. So, I question, do you know if they're going to do a mid-season break like they do with walking dead prime or i was yeah i was just gonna say do you think the fourth of july is gonna be that maybe oh okay i don't know if that's i don't know if it's a sunday but that seems to be like the middle of summer break you know sure and that would maybe, be a good time to take a couple of weeks off and then build things up again yeah I, maybe that'll happen i don't think they can take as big a break as walking dead usually does because it just won't fit in with the the restart of walking dead but they can take – I think they can afford to take something of a break. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> so do you have any numbers or anything kind of prepped up there? I do. So I just have same day numbers for the first two episodes of this season of Fear. But Yeah. They were Let's hear them. They were pretty respectable. Um, same day for Monster, which was episode one of season two, was 6.67 million. Hmm. So I'm sure it got better in the uh, – in the uh, Live Plus 3 or Live Plus 7. And then We All Fall Down, which was last week, 5.58 million. So it did lose some v viewership. Um, you know, I think it's still working on finding its footing. And I think we see that reflected in the numbers. But all in all, still pretty respectable numbers. Yeah, I'd be happy if we had 5 million downloads. <laughs> Step it up, guys. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, let's see. And I had to do a little digging to see who the author and the director were because it just wasn't readily available. But the author was a guy named Alan Page. And he also produced Monster and We All Fall Down. So he went from producing one and two of the season to writing three. Hmm. And he's known for a, a show called Kin, which I've never heard of. And nope. he, he's known for what looks to me like a Latin um broadcast i i'm not i couldn't find out a whole lot about it and i don't speak spanish unfortunately but it was called xy la revista hmm. so yep if anybody's got info about alan page or those those uh shows i'd be interested to hear 
And then our director was a guy named Stephen or Stefan Schwartz. He directed The Good Man, which was the last episode of last season, which I thought was a really good episode. And yes. he's known for The Americans and for Black Sails. And I've heard great things about both of those shows. I have not watched or seen any of those things in any way, shape, or form. I haven't either. I want to say that Jesse Jackson, who does the um, Bruce Springsteen Set Lusting Bruce podcast for Southgate, is either starting at or looking at starting at a podcast for the Americans. But hmm. uh, I haven't watched it yet. All right. So our, um, our title is cool. And our title is heavy with symbolism. So I'll be interested to see what you think. And I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. It was Orboros. Yeah, Orboros. So, something like that in, in a way, shape, or form. And it's the traditional symbol of the snake eating its own tail. Right. So what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's really the whole, you know, call it karma, call, call it whatever. But uh, what goes around comes around. He who eats the tail. So I kind of struggled to really put my finger on it and say, this is what this means. This is why they titled it like this. Except that it's the whole cycle of the living to the dead and hope and then falling apart again and then hope and then falling apart again. And then all really comes down to the final axe chop of Strand. Right. Boom. Cutting the life raft because they just keep kind of going around in the circle of – you know, the boat's moving, now the boat's stopped, and now the boat's moving again at the end of the episode. You know, so that's kind of a, a circle there. But it's more so, I think, to deal with, you know, people and that karma thing. Where, you know, Strand was kind of seen as in control and being secretive, but then everything kind of gets broken apart. Mm -hmm. And now everyone's talking about his plan. And I think he, him pacing up in his cabin wasn't about... Do I want to keep these people? Don't I? I think it was more focused on he he's realizing he's losing control of the boat. So him cutting that rope was his statement of saying, I'm still in charge. Yeah, he was reasserting control. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, I think you're right. I think it has a lot to do with the cyclical nature of that symbol. And it is about patterns repeating Another thing that was kind of interesting that really hit it for me, do you remember Nick's line where he says in response to Madison, things will never clear? Because she says, oh, you know, when we get things cleared up and blah, 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 this is toward the end. And he just looks at her and says, things will never clear. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that has to do with kind of the infinity, the eternity of this new reality. And so yeah, that was kind of where that really hit for me. Yeah, and ultimately that's what it is, is this is never going away. This is the way right. the world is now. And, you know, you can even think of that the walkers are kind of that that symbol. Absolutely. Of, you know, we're human, we're there, and then the walkers are eating ourselves and then kind of goes. But anyways. So a couple more meanings, and I think you just hit right on another one. Talking about the walkers, eternal return. So I was thinking, you know, that's exactly what they're doing in coming back as walkers. It's kind of that theme of eternal return. And then one of the meanings was something that is constantly recreating itself. And I think that we see that, you know, not just in the world kind of becoming a different world and a new world with the, the outbreak, but the group constantly has to recreate itself to survive. Yeah, someone's got to step up here and really make that proclamation. And I think that's where Strand keeps coming back into play here again. I think so too. You know, you and I talked a little bit before we started recording about your episode because I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. And I think you're right. I think we're going to find out that Strand is more complex and much more of a good guy than anybody really thinks he is right now. Yeah, and good guy in the sense that he has something there for him and he's, uh, you know, we'll talk about it later, but I think I, I have my bold prediction on, on what we're going to find out. Yeah. I like your bold prediction. So I'm, I'm going to be really interested in looking at people's feedback on that. Um, the other thing is just really quickly. So the featured actor of the week, I chose, um, Michelle Eng who played Alex. And I said to you before we started recording, okay, WTF man, why are people calling her Charlie? So tell the listeners what you told me because I felt really stupid. 
Sure. So if you go out on IMDb and anything like that, so when I go out there, it's what I use to make sure I get everyone's names right, the character list. Um, you start to see that uh, they kept calling her Charlie, 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 Charlie. Well, um, that's kind of code name for when she was going to arrive. Uh, her name is Alex. That's what they call her in the show. But uh, on The Talking Dead, she was even when uh, 462 was filming it was called Rhino. That I was what missed it was referred that. to. Oh, yeah. that's cool. So everything was kind of shrouded in secrecy because they didn't want you to know who was going to make it. They didn't want you to know who was going to be appearing. They didn't want any of the stuff to leak. So they just codenamed everything. And if you kind of go out there, you can see which websites or what reporters weren't aware of that. And judging by some of the reviews, uh, I can completely tell that uh, some places aren't even watching the show and they're writing a review for the the program because one thing that I, I consider a valid source referred to her as Charlie all the way through. And if you <laughs> watch the, the episode, the episode. Yeah. yeah. And if you watch the episode, they clearly, one of my first points is they say her name in the cold open mm-hmm. and the raft they say her name about 12 times in those two and a half minutes. And we hear her name right up to the end of the episode. Yeah. So it was just kind of, wow, people aren't even <laughs> reviewing it. So it, you, you, everyone find comfort in the fact that we are doing our best to provide you with up-to-date and accurate information. <laughs> and we actually watch the program before we talk about it. Exactly. <laughs> So, um, Alex is played by an actress named Michelle Ang, and I did not know until I, I saw her on The Talking Dead tonight that she is also from New Zealand. Yeah, two Kiwis now. Yeah, yeah. And we'll talk about um, Cliff Curtis at some point, too, because he's pretty interesting. But anyway, so she was born in October 1983 in Christchurch, New Zealand. She's actually a really well-known actress in Australia, even though we don't have much exposure to her here. And she was on three really big TV shows there called Neighbors, Outrageous Fortune, and The Tribe. Now get this. This is really funny. Listen to the the description of The Tribe. A group of young adults survive, struggle to survive in a world where all of the adults have been killed by a mysterious virus. Hmm, That's funny. (laughs) I know. When I saw that, I thought, okay, that's too classic. Um, She does have one movie that's been released here in the States. She acted in it with Martin Lawrence who I think is a really funny guy. Um, and it's called Big Mamas. Um, yeah. But uh, but beyond that, there wasn't a whole heck of a lot. So we're, we're seeing some new faces all the way through, which is a pretty cool thing. I mean, I think that we're, we're getting our money's worth in that alone. Sure. So we're going to jump right into this bad boy now? Go or for what? it, man. Let's do it. All right. So I'll, I'll lead off here with my epic... And my epic was the crabs eating the walker who was stuck Ah, in the mud. That was so good. That was, you know, it was just one of the moments where it's like, that is actually pretty damn cool. So to kind of watch them as they're like kind of picking them apart and then he's trying to eat some of the crabs, I guess. And he kind of crunches them up in his hand. And it's just that neat little bit of something that it really didn't need to be there. It had no real effect on anything. Other than it just being a really cool visual that the crabs don't know any different. They just see it as food and, and they're the starting to harvest it. <laughs> yeah. But think about that in the context of our title. Yeah, that's uh, another true story yeah. there. It was, no, I really thought that was great. My husband pointed it out and I was like, oh my God, those look just like the black crabs that tried to eat me while we were in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not have my knitting needles then. So, <laughs> What's yours? Well, so my epic was actually the whole plane crash set, because I felt like even though we've seen a plane crash impacted by the zombie zombie apocalypse in World War Z, this was really different because we saw it from the ground and we saw them explore it as a whole set. I I really liked um, the moment where we saw the walker in the oxygen mask. That was really cool. And then, oh, go go ahead. ahead. No, no, no. And I was just going to say, you know, then when that guy opens his eyes and says, help me, 
And then Travis ends up having his first kill of a survivor who's going to most likely turn. That was pretty huge. Yeah, so we know The Walking Dead's really good at build, building sets. Obviously, the prison and the towns and all the stuff they go through and the, the caves and all this cool stuff. So to see the plane was really cool. And um, as Nick kind of walks in there and is looking around and... Like, if you look, like, you can see food trays and stuff, so that was kind of cool. Right. Um, when you walk in and see the, the walker in the oxygen mask, I knew that guy was alive because that walker wasn't trying to get Nick. It was trying to get the guy in that seat. Oh, good catch. He was lurching at him. I'm like, oh, that guy's alive. Because that walker kept trying to eat the guy in front of him with a broken spine. And that so was a like, good visual effect, by the way. I really, yeah, that was really cool. really like that. Protruding spinal cord. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of cool just to kind of see this. You know, yeah, there is a plane wreck. So you are going to run into people in their seats still. Yeah. Um, and that, what you described, you know, we'll talk about that, that kill coming up later. Because I think it's got some larger impacts. Cool. And yeah, so I just, I liked it as a new set. I liked it as something that we haven't really seen before. And the other thing that I thought was really cool was the way that they were looting the luggage. And then um, Daniel Salazar says something like, it's bad, bad juju, or it's a bad omen to steal from the dead. And I thought, dude, this is the world you're living in now. Yeah, they are very religious and they are very, um, you know, they they have those traditions I guess, and stealing from the dead. But that's why I said, you know, take only what you need, not not everything that you want. Right. Um, so, no, it was cool. And I did think also, and then I'll, I'll get off my epic, that the imagery of the, the rosary and then the rosary being given to Ophelia, mm -hmm. it was just kind of an interesting connection, probably intentional between this and the main series. Just yeah. a, a visual connection. Yeah, I think so. So, so that was my epic. So, what's your fail? Uh, well, so my fail really came more out of a discussion on the Talking Dead afterwards. So, there was a fan poll, and they asked about whether or not people thought we would see Alex again after Strand cut her loose. Mm -hmm. And most of the people who responded to the poll, something like ninety percent of the respondents, said, "Oh, we're absolutely going to see." Alex again and then one of the guests that they had on some some guy who's a professional wrestler Jericho Jericho he was like oh no overdone they're in the middle of the ocean you're never gonna see her again and I thought really that's all we get after all that hype from flight 462 we get the the whole lead in that this this special guest or this this survivor is going to be integrated into our group of survivors sure. in fear and we're never going to see her again well, I think so. All right, bold prediction number one is we are going to see her again. Okay, Thomas Reese, I hope you're you're counting this. Number yeah, one, we are going to see her again. Thomas got me. Here we go. <laughs> so I do think we'll see her again because they wouldn't have invested this much into this and doing it to just have her die. I would sure I, hope not. Where I think she'll come back as, as she will come back as a captive. On somebody else's crew at some point. Like maybe the people who made contact with Alicia? In, in, in a sense, yeah. You know, it, it's somebody else is going to pick her up. Okay. And then that's where we'll kind of, the two groups, they're going to have to fight it out with another group here at some point. They've been dodging these other boats for a long time now. Right. So they're going to have to fight it out with another group. And I think that group will have picked up Alex. And that's how, once our group wins, Alex is going to go with our group now. But will, you know, so the other thing is, if she comes back, which I think she's going to come back to, I sure hope that's not the sum and total of our return on the investment. <laughs> um, is she going to have some resentment? Is there going to be some sort of animus there because of Strand cutting her free? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, because the kid's going to die. Yeah, and he you was going to die anyway. Yeah, he was going to die anyway. But interesting to see that she killed um, the other guy. Two people, yeah, defending him. 
Yeah. Which is just, you just met this kid and you kill two live people. Like, I get the first one, but the second one that was just, you know, if you don't put him out of your misery, I will. And then clearly she kills him later because he's not there anymore. And he floats up as the body. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it just, it, it's it's there somewhere. It's It has to happen. And I think she will hold that against Strand, but she sees everybody else has this problem with the decision. Um, the, I think the other thing that's important too is, you know, they hinted around it on the talking dead. I do think she has some kind of special knowledge that we don't have at this point. Yeah. So, all right. There's, there's gotta be something either strand or her have an advanced knowledge of what's going on because there has to be some sort of play in why some people are way, way ahead of the curve. Right. Than others aren't because in this universe, Zombies does not exist. There's not that lore. You know, there was no, there's no zombie movies ever in this universe. So no that's why George everything Romero. is new. <laughs> Right. So the, the whole point is somebody had to have known something from somewhere. So that's going to come out. Now, one thing I will say, and I probably should say this for the end as its own, but I'm sidetracked and I keep thinking about it. So I have to say it. Robert Kirkman in an interview this week said, there are clues in Fear the Walking Dead that relate to The Walking Dead. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you about that. I wanted to talk about that. So I'm really, really glad you brought that up. So I kind of tried to watch with that eye, but I didn't really see a whole lot tonight. What did you see? I seen people wanting to get other people to watch this show. He said clues. Yeah. So clues is very open-ended and... You know, there's clues about it. Sure, clues about to the beginning of the outbreak, you know, stuff like that. And even in their new comic book line, they're, they've they just started issue number one, Walking Dead, the alien. And the alien is not referenced to UFOs. It's in reference to, quote, alien, an individual in another country, Spain in this case. It's an American in Spain. And that American is Rick Grimes' brother. No way. Yeah. So I had heard that there was a new comic book coming out. I didn't read any further than that. That's really cool. Yeah. So they get that out of the way pretty quick. And it's, he's like, I got to get home and I got to do this or whatever. And, um, you know, I, my, my brother is a deputy. His name's Rick Grimes or something. There's something. and Something that's pretty obvious. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they're very clearly trying to attach everything they do to The Walking Dead monster that it is um so i got some stuff later about that mindset but yeah so i think there you know there's clues in fear but i don't think they're deliberate clues that are going to help you solve a puzzle i think they're just going to be similarities in the show where you go oh man like uh, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> but little places that hook you in and remind you of the thing that got you addicted in the first place. Right. So my fail is the kids are still seemingly unaware of swarming or mobs of walkers. When they're just, over at the at the site. Yeah, yeah. You know, they just they've always no one's watching anybody's back. They're really just kind of head down, not really paying attention, not really caring about anything. I do so have that's to, just, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's just it's just kind of frustrating that they're still not aware or com aware of their surroundings at this point. So I think the thing that was really interesting about that whole thing is that Nick inadvertently discovered the meat poncho or the blood suit or whatever you want to call it. This was, yeah, I was this was his little, little nod to guts, you know. Yeah, you know. So that's you know, is that the clue to the Walking Dead? You know. Um, I was a little sad that it happened off camera. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted because if we see that one fall down in there, so it's kind of like, ooh, this is going to get gruesome really fast. Yeah, yeah, how did he do it or what happened? But um, you know what? It's nice that he found that out. Well, and you, I really felt like we saw him notice that. I'm not entirely sure we saw anyone else notice that. I'm sure they'll talk about it later. You okay. know, they'll start sharing information. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see how it comes about. Um, so my epic fail is Madison. 
I really, really dislike her. Like, really dislike her character. She is my Lori. I was just thinking that. <laughs> yeah. Just the whole, you know, she's she's barking at orders. She is the she's the clearly the female lead in this show. Totally understand. But she is barking orders and it's a, a hysterical barking orders. Like when they're out on the boat and they see Daniel and Alex coming over. She's like, hey, hey, wait, come back here. You know, she's like yelling to them. And it's like, you're an idiot. Nobody can hear you. <laughs> so, yes, I get it. Heat of the moment, you're going to yell just because. But we got to go now. And it's just like, shut up. Like, the boat's not even fixed yet. And you're telling them we have to go now. Like, just stop it. So she's really becoming very, you know, she just thinks she's the most important. She thinks she's the smartest and she thinks she's making the decisions. And that really goes back to Strand cutting the rope on that, on that safety boat because he realizes yeah. that these people are getting too brave. You know, when she goes in there to talk to Strand about Mexico and, you know, you weren't going to tell anybody and we were just going to do this. And you know, who do you think you are? And we got to trust each other. And he's like, excuse me. Like I have literally saved your guys's life and done all of this for you. And you have all of this. And still you guys are going behind my back and doing all this stuff and making demands of me. Yet I've brought you along this whole time. Mm -hmm. I could have dropped you off. I could have killed you all. So it's just, she is really just a pain in my ass right now. <laughs> well, we kind of hit on the same epic fail because there were two things about Madison that really bothered me in this episode. You know, first was just the way that we're watching her relationship with Travis deteriorate. And, you know, I understand that relationships can really suffer when you're having significant stress, but... You know, we have this moment where I'm almost thinking at the beginning, okay, they're going to have some repair in their relationship. They're going to start understanding each other again. And then, blam, it's gone. You know? And I just don't see the relationship there that I would expect between a couple that A, was going to get married, and B, is trying to survive together. Well, I think that relationship went downhill when the ex-wife was back into the picture. Not that it's a bad thing, but... With the whole her saving and her contributing and really setting her relationship aside. Yeah. Whereas Madison still wasn't. Madison was still doing that protective, I'm the new wife, you're the ex-wife stance in it where she was not. She was just like, we're here, we're in, this is the situation, I'm a nurse, I'm going to help everybody. And all the way through to then Travis having to kill her. I think that was his emotional disconnect of nothing really matters. No relationship matters at this point. I just need to protect my son. Interesting. And, you know, while you say that, I think back on Liza, and she was one of the truly likable characters in the first season. Mm -hmm. So, and, and she was, her death was noble. You know, she knew that she needed to, to die so that she didn't hurt anybody. So we'll see how that kind of works out. So my other thing about Madison was I I feel like I, I'm just feeling a, a little manipulated that I'm being forced to believe that there is this huge conflict building between her and Strand because I think, and maybe I'm wrong, but I think that you would be a little more grateful and a little more open to the person who took you on his boat and who saved your life and saved your family and I agree, I don't like the way that she is pushing, pushing, pushing at him, you know? I mean, I'm not saying this in a feminist way or a patriarchal way or anything like that. It's not man versus woman. It's the fact that these two people have been set up in opposition to each other. And yeah, I'm, I'm just right not crazy bar, about that. Right off the start. Um, yeah. In her last comment, and this is just me, you know, if she when she tells Strand, if, you, if I even think you're up to something, I will throw I you over. I know. And she's like, I would kill you right now. Uh, you know, and someone like Strand actually would. So, you sniff that? <laughs> you. I do. I smell it. 
I gotta say one more thing about Madison though, because oh, I'm just okay. bitchy tonight. Oops. Um, I think that she also doesn't get to play Mother of the Year with how screwed up her kids are. No, not at all. She's a wreck herself. Yeah. Okay, now I'm smelling something that sounds kind of okay. it's kind of salty. It's cracking yeah. like seaweed, but it's not <laughs> quite. <laughs> um. So let uh, so now while we're on the strand gig here, I, I want to keep talking about this. Okay, go. So for it. he keeps calling on that that sat phone, the satellite phone, and he is concerned. His growing concern, where he was more or less having a leisurely conversation in the old cafe last week on the island, and now you can see that his tensions are rising, his frustration is rising, his anger is rising. And he's becoming very short-tempered. Not necessarily at everybody else, but at the situation mm -hmm. that he knows he's missing some sort of window of opportunity. And I strongly believe that is his wife or his son slash daughter. I definitely believe where your strand is trying to save some family member and get there to help them. And that's kind of back to my strand as a good guy theory, but it's just more solidified now that you can see him losing his cool and he's scared of what's being said on the other side of that phone that we can't hear. So I am so glad that you said that because throughout my notes, I kept writing, who is strand trying to reach? What has got him so upset? What has got him so on edge? And that makes sense to me as an explanation. So do you think there's a big house in the hills, a big drug dealer compound, drug lord compound up in the hills? Well, so the other thing, the thing that I wrote along with who is he trying to reach is I was like, this has got to be about drugs or money. And so those were definitely my first thoughts. But that's in keeping with the Strand is a bad guy. Strand is truly one of the worst that we're going to run into. Strand is the governor, whatever. But I think when you put the overlay of potentially he's got family or a significant other that he's trying to take care of, it almost doesn't matter if those other two things are involved. Yeah, and at this point, you're like, wow, I'm glad he, we ran into a drug kingpin. Right, because he's got the resources we need. <laughs> he's got, yeah, he's got all the cool stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm, I'm conflicted on whether the town exists. So on one side, I see where the town or this large compound would exist, and he would need a group of 10 people to work this compound. Everybody uh -huh. carries their fair share. That so makes I've good got, sense. Yeah, I've got a mechanic. I've got a sleazy guy. I've got kids. I've got all these people who can contribute and farm, and we have a well and all this stuff. So we, I am going to need help sustaining this life, and these people are going to work for me. So it's like Herschel and the governor had a baby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and kind named of. him Strand. <laughs> Well, it would almost be like a Negan type of deal. I'm providing security. Therefore. You provide me with food. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So I Although can see I think he's that. more likable than that. We Now he is. I, I do think he has. Yeah. I mean, I think that he is. Although there are people who talk about uh, Walking Dead Prime and the comic books who say that Negan is very charming. So who knows? Maybe they're playing that angle, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> or Strand could be totally lying about this town, this compound. And he's just saying that to keep their hopes alive, that he's not risking a mutiny and he's going to go and they're going to find some little canoe and it's going to have whoever he wants in it. And there's no real direction. So the question that I have in response to that line of thinking, though, is what does he gain? Because I definitely think, although I think he's better than we thought he was, that Strand is someone who operates in the realm of something to gain. And he doesn't, I don't know, I just don't see that he gains a whole lot if he's stringing the group on for nothing. Right. I, I think that he stands to gain a whole heck of a lot if he's stringing the group on the way that you were first talking about. Yes, there is this safe place. And yes, we can secure it and make it productive for all of us. I think it's more so the, the first, that there yeah. is a place. But when we get to that place, it's probably not going to last or it's going to be overrun. Yeah. 
because they get there and that's it. Series is over. They <laughs> found this sweet compound and now they live forever. Yeah, we thought that with the prison and the farm too, and that didn't happen. <laughs> so I, yeah, I mean it's it's strands cool. There's lots of things at play, but uh, ultimately it's all going to be for for nothing, uh, just because it's not going to work out that way, and we know it's not. So what do you got? Well, so mine is kind of along the same lines, but it was just the whole idea that, you know, all of a sudden we're finding people who we thought were going to be going to be our heroes less likable and we're finding Strand more likable. Like, I was very excited about Ruben Blades and the whole character of Salazar last season. And I find that right now I'm not as excited about him. I don't, I thought he was a really good guy and now I'm kind of thinking he's not so good, you know? yeah. And, it's, you know, you thought Maddie and, and Travis, the teacher and the guidance counselor, were going to be heroes. And that they're not so heroic either. But, you know, maybe the whole thing is, is that they're all just human. Nobody's heroic. Nobody's heroic at this point. And I, I agree with that. Um, it is frustrating watching uh, Daniel. Like, I was like, oh, man, this guy's going to be such a badass. But now, he's kind of a little weasel to me right now. Yeah. And I mean, he's his whole. Well, he's doing this, and I'm telling you this, and no, no, no. I mean, he just, he just the whole ratting Strand out. Yeah. Well, you go talk to Strand because it wouldn't end good for me. Yeah. Uh, buddy, he'd kill you. Yeah. You know, so it's it's frustrating to kind of see him, but is that him just needing to control the situation and being that manipulator? You know, he's. He's forcing that conflict between Madison and Strand, not himself and Strand. And maybe that's all part of it, too. You just suddenly hit on something else for me. Maybe we're just seeing everybody angle for power right now, and they're all a little unappealing because of the ways that they're angling for power differently. Yeah, I would be doing the exact same thing because I... That's who I am. I'm not a follower. I would have some sort of control of that situation in some way, shape, or form. Uh, that's me. That's who I am. That's what I have to to be and do. And I couldn't just accept everything that we're just going to go and do. It, it just wouldn't work for me. I'm not sure who I would be. I think I would be the person going, get those black crabs off of me. That's funny. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to think that I would be tough and that I would be a survivor, but I don't know, honestly. And definitely less so in the world of fear, because it's all still very chaotic and you don't know who you can trust, as opposed to the world of Walking Dead Prime, which always, you know, people were bad, like Shane was bad and the governor was bad, but you always kind of knew that there was this core that was going to take care of each other. Mm hmm. You know, and I just don't feel that in this group yet. So let's talk about Chris. Yeah. So, I, you know, the, the actor was on Talking Dead. He also said that he felt like the, the first human kill was significant. So go for it. Tell me what you got. Well, I was, um, the whole reason he went was to kill some walkers. So clearly this is his emotional release and how he copes with the feelings that he has. Right. Um, you know, he did reveal on the talking dead that, you know, Chris is dealing with these emotions. He wants to tell his dad, but he can't tell his dad because of the things he's doing. So this is kind of his therapy as he goes and he was enjoying killing last week, you know, through the fence. Right. And that's why he was going to do it again. Cause he wanted to go kill and, and feel that rush and, get that out of his system and then he would go back and be okay and because nobody was around. Nobody was watching him. So he wanted it. And then he ultimately wound up having to kill a person. A, a real, a living person. Which I yeah. don't think was going to mess him up too bad until he hit the guy twice and then the guy just like looked at him and like yes. he couldn't even talk. And he just looked at him and then like you seen him panic and then he just started clubbing the hell out of him. So I think that's the moment where it's really going to affect him, but affect him in a good sense for us because he is now going to be the one to push that line of um, morals and values quicker. Right. Him and Alex, then I always kind of thought it was going to be Nick. I thought Nick was going to be that guy. 
But, um, you know, it's not even Strand at this point. Strand hasn't killed anybody. You know what I thought about Nick tonight? I thought, and again, this comes from him kind of dismissively saying to his mom, it never gets clearer. But I thought this is kind of the world of the drug addict. You know, this is perfect for him. This is kind of that endless walking nightmare. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And then I thought about Daryl and I was like, you know, this is the world where Daryl became somebody significant. So just kind of an interesting parallel there. Hmm. Um, just the whole, the, they find a lot of the drugs, a lot of the yes. amoxicillins and stuff like yeah. that. So I'm curious as to how that's going to work out. Um, we didn't see him give him those meds. You know, he went up and sat with Ophelia and nobody gave, gave them the, uh, the medicine. Nobody gave her the stuff. So right. what happened with it? Well, uh, does Nick know some trickery to crush it and mix it with an asthma inhaler and snort it and it gets him <laughs> high? Well, I think the other thing is, does anybody know that she has an infection? Because she overall looks pretty good for someone who had the gunshot wound she has. She isn't acting like she's particularly sick. She's acting like she's having a little pain. So as far as I know, the only person who knows that she has an infected wound is is Salazar, is her dad. Yeah, and that's why he told her that as well. He right. goes, no, this is between you and me. Don't tell anybody. And she's like, well, why? They're good people. And he said, if they have to choose between you know her daughter and you she is going to choose her her daughter over you every single time. And then I think Ophelia kind of, oh, my dad's right. Even though, you know, it's not wise, he's still right in the sense that at some point, these people will choose their own over me regardless. Right. And if that's me having an infection, they might think it's the wrong infection. And right. then down, down we go. I think the conflict between Salazar and Ophelia is is interesting. I think that has the potential to continue to be a big challenge in his face and in her face throughout this season. So I'm I'm really interested to see how they're going to play that and if they're going to resolve that. I agree. Maybe one of them will die and then the unresolved conflict will be even worse. Well, and that's I'm wondering if Ophelia if her infection is going to speed up and then she's going to wind up dying. Which is very possible. I mean, that's essentially how Griselda, her mom, died. <laughs> so that would be a double blow to Salazar. Or is she going to start getting on the med and then he dies? <sighs> Maybe I, he has a heart attack or something. I think she is very weak and I think that her survival would be... Not an ideal thing for this group. But I think at this point, Salazar is really untrustworthy. So, you know, I think it could go either way in terms of, of which death benefits or or doesn't benefit the group, you know? Sure. Well, do you have um, anything else? Not really. Just, um, I think that the uh, the cutting of the raft is is extremely significant. And that will have a lot of stuff later on down the road. That That's really him asserting himself as I still make the decisions here. And I think that people are going to try and get all pissed off at Strand. So I think we're going to kick off next week's episode with uh, a heart-to-heart -heart about who's still in charge and who's still making the decisions. Uh it looks it looks good from the the uh, previews, by the way. The previews look really good. Yeah, something bad's going to happen. Yeah, let's hope, man. <laughs> yeah, let's hope. Let's hope something really bad happens. So anything from the Facebook page that you want to... Oh, wait a minute. Here we go. So Thomas Omara has a review for us already. Better than last week, but still not a lot going on. Three obvious references to The Walking Dead Rosary Beads out of five. Aha. <laughs> uh -huh. That's awesome. <laughs> um, as always, if you're having a little trouble um, staying with us here through this, reach out. Let's talk through it. Um, you know, we can really, really get together and really kind of figure out why we like this, why we hate it. 
um, anything kind of like that, you know. So there, there's lots of opportunities here to discuss this um, this program. Yeah, and you know, it it's been a little quiet on the Facebook page, but we know it'll pick back up. And uh, do you have the results of the poll? Do we have those? Do we do we want to reveal oh, those? Oh, jeez, we... I will have to go back and find that somewhere. That's okay, you guys. Time. So we have one more week where you can vote on the poll about who was killed by Lucille and Negan. So search that poll out on our Facebook page and let us know what you think if you haven't already. You bet. All um, right, everybody. Oh, I did. Want, I wanted to point out one more thing. I'm sure you saw it. I hope you did. So Kirk actually posted a non-Walking Dead piece, but it was a really nice tribute to Prince. So if you're a Prince fan, take a look at that picture that he posted up for us. And uh, I'm seriously thinking about getting one. <laughs> I know Sorry. you're like, it would be meaningful to me if somebody from Metallica died. <laughs> there you go. That would that would affect me in, in some way, shape, or form. We will uh, we'll definitely get... Kirk to do a tribute piece for you too, okay? <laughs> yeah, I need a metallic one. That would be that would be beautiful. Give me metallic zombies. I want you to know that while I was get while my husband and I were getting inked in Hawaii, he got his first tattoo. I got my fifth. Um, he the guys that were did the tats were playing rancid and a group called um, the Swinging Utters, and it was L- current fairly current LA punk stuff, and it was really good. So definitely gonna be gonna be looking up uh, their music. I kn- I've heard of Rancid before, had not really listened to them, had never mm-hmm. heard of the Swinging Utters before. So definitely gonna check them out too. <laughs> so I will say one thing here. We'll we'll end on a very serious note here. Um, I just want to send uh, good thoughts and prayers to my buddy Mike. Um, I had a friend who uh, was in a hunting party with his family, and uh, ultimately that that hunting. Family hunting party uh, ended in tragedy uh, this weekend. So, no. uh, thoughts and prayers to the family, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry to hear that. No, um, it's alright. I, I um, hope, hope everybody is. Yeah, it's uh, just it's just you know it's an opportunity to uh, to uh, take life one day at a time and just you know be thankful for any moment that you can. Yeah, that's right. So everybody, take it one, one day, dead day at, at a time. time.